Thank you very much um, for introducing me. And uh, do you hear me well? Yes? Very good. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm really happy. Um, I'm unhappy I cannot chain, join longer with other ties. Um, I will be here over the week and be giving another talk in the workshop part on Monday. Um, so the title is uh, very well fitting to what we heard in the last part of the last talk. So, so that was just entering the topic of optimal mechanics. So I, I think it's just a very good transition. I'm working in Vienna, actually, together with a group of Markus Aspelmeier, who is, I need to take care of, uh, with a group of Markus Aspelmeier, who is actually one of the people who started in the early days of optomechanics, um, beginning of the millennium. And I myself have a, have a subgroup um, on levitation. This is uh, a bit more than the people in the subgroup because we optical levitation, which is my uh, field of um, work, and, and magnetic levitation, which if there's still time left in the very end, I might say a few words about as well. So for the, oh, wow. <laughs> so for the structure of, of the whole lecture, I, I basically wanted to split it in, in three parts, and uh, that's too little to Outline, so I should say it. Um, in the beginning, I, I make some introduction, also historical, but mainly physical, into the field of optomechanics. Um, and then I will go a little bit more into, into so which is part of this introduction, into the readout, always uh, spreading in some of the more recent results on the thing. And in the very end, um, I will, of the three lecture parts, I will go into where people had already ideas to use that to show um, really tests of the coherence models or similar, as you heard about last week, mainly. So this is the this is the whole motivation why I talk about optomechanics would be on this conference. I'm sorry, the trapped particle mass. Um, the question is, can we use objects as big as this one? So this is uh, 20 micrometer in size, roughly. Uh, or that actually has a 50 di micron diameter, this mirror here, which you can see with a bare eye. That's part, uh, it's essentially the size of a hair. Can we use that and put it in a superposition state out of, say, up and down, or oscillating in two parts? Um, and uh, in order to have something like a mechanical test state. Or in more recent ideas, and what I am mainly working on, um, same thought, but could we do the same thing, for example, with, with a particle that is optically trapped? And this is, this is also uh, where it fits well in with the end of the last talk, because that was the main idea, I guess, in this uh, graphene example as well. Now, this slide is probably on half of all the optomechanics talks. I still repeat it um, uh, for you. It's, there's, there's several other ideas of why you would like to have mechanical systems in your quantum regime. Uh, not only that you have these like 10 to the 20, up to 10 to the 20 atom sized objects, we are, we're going to stick more to 10 to the 10 to 12, um, that you might be able to prepare in quantum states, but also mechanical resonators are already used for force sensing. Um, your mobile phone has a mechanical resonator inside for acceleration sensing. Um, but then there's also like gravity measurement, uh, gravity field measurements of the Earth, Earth's field, all based on mechanical resonators. Not all, but mainly based on mechanical resonators of different types. And the question is if that is brought towards the limits of quantum physics, can we improve there and if we use the tools we have in quantum physics, can we improve it even further? <clears throat> and finally, um, mechanical resonators can be functionalized, so you can make them magnetic or you put them, uh, something, something else on top and, um, sorry, 
and, and then you can come up with ideas where, for example, here in, in this proposal, there were like several resonators coupled to, to the artificial atoms, and then um, the resonators would be charged and would uh, make an interaction um, that you couldn't get over such a long distance, just mediated by the mechanism. <clears throat> and the whole field is not very old. I mean, I mean, there have been ideas around for a long time on, on radiation pressure uh, for using that also, but but experimentally, um, this is really this has really started in 2010 that people could do a quantum experiment with such a macroscopic resonator. So in this uh, groundbreaking experiment, which is not optomechanical, it's um, um, you have this this resonator. It's a layer of aluminum, aluminum nitride and aluminum, and that's cleared so electric, and therefore it couples to an electric field. And, um, and the compressional mode, like when the thing is doing this, has something like uh, six gigahertz. And six gigahertz is such a high frequency that the ground state uh, energy of H bar omega is larger than the temperature thermal energy KBT that you would get in a cryostatic 20 millikelvin, which one can basically buy off the shelf. I mean, they're pretty expensive, but you can buy them. So, so they put this device inside such a cryostat and coupled it to a superconducting qubit where, <clears throat> where one has really an artificial atom with two levels, which I won't go into much now, but, uh, but what they could show is something that we know from atomic physics and has been done there much before. Uh, they could use this two-level system and write um, a superposition of zero and one via some um, heat splitter interaction, basically, onto the mechanical state, such that this would be in the superposition of being occupied with zero or one photon. So this is really something like a small, like a small of these cats I was talking about before. But then at the same time, uh, so so here's here's the experiment. Uh, what they what they do is they use just like in ion physics, um, pi over two pulses um, to to prepare the qubit and uh, to make the positions um, over a certain time. Then they wait for a time tau when the state is zero plus one in the of the of the mechanical resonator, and then they read the thing out again. What you see is that uh, one can uh, really, and because one has a superposition written there, one gets a kind of interferometric measurement, and therefore information of whether this thing stayed in a superposition of zero and one occupation, or if that just got a mixture of the two. I put this a little bit down here. Could you tell me if you don't hear me anymore? <clears throat> so, and, and in this uh, Ramsey type uh, experiment, they could uh, see this interference bridges. Yes? To make the separa separation larger. Um, so, so here they really rely on the, on the mechanics being, with being um, in the ground state and then you just use this first level because um, the other levels are not fully reached. But then as the, in the harmonic oscillator, the spacing is equal, you could not play the same tricks for like putting another occupation on and another occupation on you would, because that would always happen at the same energy. And you would not end up with like five uh, phonon occupation, but with, with something um, more coherent. Um, oh, that's, it's not the next slide, I thought it's the next slide, but uh, I said, uh, yes, you can, and, um, uh, and I'll, I mean, most of the system I'll talk about are going towards having, like, a bigger separation. So, <clears throat> this was still the point on, on, on being able to couple the system to different, different degrees of freedom, so this was our example now where one used capacitive coupling, uh, one could use spin coupling. Um, there's nice experiments where one actually uh, couples 
to atoms on the surface. And um, also other nice experiments where one actually uses atoms themselves as a mechanical resonator mode. Um, there's very recent ideas uh, where one hopes to get large um, interference uh, with, with magnetic levitation and uh, readout, but for example, also via flux through a, a Joseph tube junction. And there is uh, the main topic of this talk, um, optomechanics, where we want to talk to the mechanical resonator by uh, photon exchange. Now, in the first place, this might seem like a not so clever idea because the interaction due to the photon recoil is really, really small. But then on the other side, uh, first, we can have many photons. And second, um, there's hardly a quantum system or actually no quantum system that we can control as well as light photons. And it's very well isolated. So um, now th that goes into the direction of the question before. Um, we, of course, would like to have uh, larger superpositions, which means we need smaller masses but we would also like to have long coherence time. So um, the, the thing, this, this resonator I was talking about here has, has the six gigahertz frequency and you can see here this ring down of the interference pattern. So we are talking here really on a, of, a, of a coherence time of nanoseconds, right? It's not only a small superposition, it's also extremely short-lived. Um, while in matter wave interferometry where we, what you hear, hear about that much more this week, but not from me. Um, in matter wave interferometry, the coherence times are much longer, the masses are much smaller, um, and the question is, in this, in this case, can we increase the mass? And this is, again, where, where this uh, idea of optical levitation comes in, um, that I will repeatedly uh, spread into the talk. Um, I hope I'm not advertising it too much, even though it's my, my favorite system uh, compared to the others. But this is where, where um, levitated, why actually levitated optomechanics was invented. If you take a nanoparticle uh, that is optically trapped and you can prepare it with the methods that I will talk about, then uh, you can afterwards switch off the trap and go from a, from a mechanical resonator system to a free falling. Now, I hope I motivated sufficiently that, that um, the mechanical resonators in the quantum regime are, are interesting. And uh, I said we want to do that with light. So some history on, on um, the mechanical influence of light. Um, actually, that was already um, postulated, if you want, by, by Kepler in the 17th century, uh, who explained that when one sees a comet flying by, one sees these tails, and he said that these tails would be uh, explainable by radiation pressure. Now he got it half right, um, so there's two tails, and, uh, and uh, the two tails come from the winds from the sun, uh, which are charged on the one side, so anything that is charged would be uh, blown away by, by this, uh, this, this sun wind. I don't know how you say it. Solar wind, okay, uh, by the solar wind. And, um, but then there's also a part of the tail which is deflected a little bit less, and this is um, really particles, dust particles that are not charged, which are hit by radiation pressure and then lose the comet. In the lab, uh, no, sorry, um, and nowadays, I, I was researching this a little bit be just before this talk because I found it interesting. Uh, I was surprised that there's already so many projects on this. Nowadays, we are thinking, that we in the sense of humankind, are thinking um, of using uh, this radiation pressure as a propulsion system. So here you see uh, a, a light sail with 32 square meters. That's actually version one. Um, there's several other versions. And, um, and here radiation pressure is really pushing, pushing a a light mass in space. When it comes to doing um, experiments with radiation pressure in the lab, uh, then 
uh, you might know actually this, this kind of little system here. It's a sundial, and um, and it's one one can buy it just because it looks nice. Uh, so so if light is shining on this kind of a mill, then it starts to turn. And as probably many of you know, in most of the ones that you can buy, this is not really because of uh, the photon kick by the by the photons, but this is because um, where more light hits this ring, it heats up, and then the and then the air is repulsed more strongly, and that's why it moves. But actually, in 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 these experiments in the beginning of the 20th century, it, they they worked hard to to get rid of the air defect, and were pumping out such a such a glass, and inside having a similar kind of system, which was actually invented by Cook. And, uh, and they could actually show uh, effects of radiation pressure in this system. At the time, that was extremely hard. And, and then, a little bit later, um, Arthur Ashkin observed, um, when, when, when looking at a laser, I mean, many, many people had seen that. When you look at a laser beam, and a very strong one, then, then sometimes particles fly in. And one gets the impression that these particles are actually moving along the laser. So, so people were asking themselves, uh, why, why would that happen? And um, so uh, the way he puts it in his book, so this is a big book on everything Arthur Ashkin did, um, he, he, he kind of did some back of the envelope and uh, estimations and saw that the effect of radiation pressure on really small masses is actually not that small. And which led him to, to kind of invent um, optical trapping. So, so what you see here is, is just a green laser that is pointing upwards. And uh, what is shining here is a, is a particle of roughly 20 microns in size that is trapped in this laser beam. It, uh, radiation, radiation pressure is pushing the particle up, and the gravity is pulling it down. And that's why, that's why it levitates. Field then mainly uh, went into the direction of manipulating, for example, biological samples in, in liquid. Um, but these were like first experiments where one was levitating such a field, actually also in an evacuated chamber, so, so he could uh, really observe nice oscillations in the trap. And this gave rise to, to quite another big uh, impact field, so people also <clears throat> started to into uh, trapping atoms, and in the 90s there were the success, first successes on, on really uh, using light fields to decelerate atoms and to uh, trap atom clouds. For example, here in, in, in an old experiment, uh, natrium atoms, and uh, as you might know, it was so long ago a part of the Nobel Prize not so long ago, leading about controlling single particles. Quantum physics. So um, today, uh, optical levitation got, uh, was kind of reinvented a little bit. And, um, just a second. and what you can see here is, what you can see here is a, is a levitated nanoparticle that is um, in, uh, trapped inside an atom particle field. Now, already in Arthur Ashkin's experiment, well, the question would have been, after what I explained, um, if the particle is pushed upwards and then, the, and then um, gravity pulls it down, what is about the other direction, right? I couldn't, I couldn't hold a particle on the top of you. So the reason why the particle would still be trapped is because of gradient forces in the optical field. And... Um, uh, many, many of you, uh, I guess, will know this. It's, it's, as I said, also in atom optics and science. But just, just as a starter, the white chalk. So, so for, for such a small particle, how would the force look like? Let's start somewhere over here. Um, so, we have this laser beam, and this little particle inside, and. Um, then the force that acts on the particle is just 
uh, given by the gradient of alpha times the electric field. Um, where this is just an induced dipole from the field and then uh, interacting with the electric field itself. So the force would be given by, actually minus the gradient, um, would be given by, by the gradient of alpha times the field squared. So in, what that says is such a small particle would always be pulled towards the intensity maximum of a field. And, um, and the polarizability of a, this alpha is the polarizability, is how strongly it can be polarized by the electric field, is for a, for a spheric particle given by, um, this is in vacuum, um, this is why there's only one uh, dielectric constant, uh, one refractive index, And, um, and from this, we can uh, get, if the polarizability is independent of the field, then, then this gives us a, a energy, um, alpha quarter times the squared. And um, now if I look at, at such a, such a Gaussian um, trapping beam, then the radial profile of this beam would be, would be Gaussian, right? So e to the minus x square over the, the waist square. This is the radial direction. Um, and then, and then I can uh, from this I can estimate how how fast the particle. Would so that would be something like minus half a quarter, um, some, some meter, e to the minus um, so x square over waist square, and that's approximately some some offset. alpha quarter yes and and this year like uh, the energy of the particle in this uh, as you would guess uh, approximated for for small deviations uh, of x of the center would give a harmonic oscillator, and we know that the spring constant of this harmonic oscillator is this three factor. So we have m omega square um, for this. And we get that omega is given by the square root of the second factor alpha over 2m um, e square over waist square. And this e-tweezer, of course, contains still parts, like if the particle would be here, then, then the waste would change. So, so this is a frequency that we get for the particle, and just to, to give you some, sorry. Uh, tweezer, it's, it's just a suffix because I, uh, TW, I, I, yes. I, I, call, I took a suffix because I, I separated the radial and the axial particles. Um, so, so just to give you some numbers, if if I take a if I take a hundred milliwatt uh, laser beam, and um, and such a particle here, uh, which has a mass of roughly ten to the minus eighteen kilogram, then then I get a frequency of of a hundred kilohertz, and um, and interesting about this is, if I look at this part here, um, this is alpha over the mass, and alpha goes with the volume, and the mass also goes with the volume. So what I get is that that this is is not depending. How do I write this? Uh, this is essentially omega of volume is is constant. Yeah, it's a stupid way to write. Sorry, you understand.
that's the volume of the that's the volume of the uh, levitated particles. So so kind of one would kind of intuitively I think suspect that uh, if I take a bigger particle with a bigger polarizability, then then the frequency should kind of go up, but it's not happening because of the m here, and um, and what goes up is actually the depth of the trap. And, and this is another number that is, of, of course, important in this context. The trap depth of such a particle would be uh, many, many room temperatures. So this is, uh, for those who know a little bit the numbers, this is very different to what we have in atom experiments, where the trap depth would be on the order of millikelvin. <clears throat> now, this is one mechanical resonator. I could also uh, think of the, the normal way to do it. Right? But let me first talk a bit about mechanical resonators in general. Um, of course, of course, uh, we have done, we have used the mechanical degree of freedom of resonators already uh, many times before. For example, in this beautiful ion experiments, here one can nicely see the mechanical oscillation. Uh, of, of a whole chain of ions going forth and back. And as you know, probably the, the, with the single ions or pairs of ions, many nice quantum um, gates actually rely on the joint motion of the ions inside the, inside the trap. Now, now, these are, of course, very light. We want really massive systems. And um, can actually manufacture mechanical resonators, uh, meanwhile, extremely well. You will see many examples of very well manufactured um, mechanical resonators. This is a particularly fascinating example of, of such a um, system. This is an array of resonators that is used as a, as a storage device uh, that was actually um, developed by IBM. And then they never used it because the solid state disks were actually uh, getting good too fast. But here, um, with this array of mechanical resonators, one achieved storage of uh, roughly the storage space of 25 dVDs on a, on a post step. So they, they are extremely densely packed. And um, of course, I don't suggest that we can do already quantum experiments with, with such a large array. But, but it shows that the scalability of me mechanical systems is very good. Now, can we see quantum effects in, in something that big? Well, this is a question that, that has actually uh, been answered already in the context of LIGO, also like 40 years ago, um, or gravitational wave detectors. So this would be a gravitational wave detector, LIGO, the arm length of four kilometer. And, and the idea behind this is only to have a, a, like this interferometer and then the arm length changes uh, relative when, when a gravitational wave passes through. So at this point, we would ask why, why we do we need to think about optomechanics? Now, now, this is one of the very complicated ways of how they mount their mirrors, because of course they have to take a lot of care that uh, all the vibrations from the surroundings are not transferred onto the mirrors, because if the mirrors move, that looks like a gravitational wave. Now, now, one can already see here, this is essentially, again, a mechanical oscillator. Only now there's a mirror with 40 kilogram now. And maybe one wouldn't really expect quantum effects. But then, um, discussed uh, in, the, in the 80s and 70s, actually, um, was whether, whether when there's really, really strong light fields, whether the shot noise of the radiation pressure would not actually be a source of noise that is relevant to the system. And, and this is one of the most beautiful abstracts I, I think <laughs> that I know of. Um, uh, there has been a controversy whether quantum mechanical radiation pressure fluctuations disturb this measurement. This re letter resolves the question, they do. So um, in the end, and this is going far ahead in, in the lecture, but in the end it turns out that there's really a fundamental limit to how well you can detect position in such a system. So coming back to coming back to mechanical resonators. Um, this is uh, 
So this is, this is the system we would look at. For example, you saw this mirror before in my slide. Um, this is uh, this 50 micrometer diameter mirror. And if you would pick this mirror, then this is classical physics as, as you know it. So just to remind you, if I kick this mirror, then I would get a ring down. And now this, I use this to define a few of the numbers that, that I'm going to come up with all of the time. So, so there's, a, there's a decay rate, gamma m. And there's a, there's a, a period 50 pi over omega m. Uh, this is the whole dynamics of the system. And when, when one talks of the mechanical quality, then this is uh, the mechanical frequency over the depth of the system. Uh, by ring down, I mean I excite the system beyond uh, what it would be thermally, and then I look at exactly this signal. Uh, so, so energy is dissipated to the environment, and I see this exactly this way. Thanks for asking. I, I just used that term. Um, so, so this oscillator, when it rings down, it doesn't ring down to zero because of this uh, force noise here. And um, I can show you one of the data taken with the levitated nanoparticles, but it doesn't matter, it's just as an example. Um, so, so when the pressure is very high, gamma m is very high, and you see on a, on a time scale that is here like on the order of milliseconds, you see that the system actually gets larger and smaller fluctuations. And then one, when one pumps down in pressure, then this gamma m goes down, and one sees more and more stable uh, signals. And down here, actually, you see that it becomes a bit funny. That is because the damping is so small that one starts to see other effects. So um, the hmm? sorry. Yes. Looks like it's what in the first line or ah yeah so so what re what's really happening is that th this is a, a slow fluctuation that is going on so so um, if you if you think about this nanoparticle it would it would feel for uh, for example nanoparticle it could be any oscillator it would feel like the kicks of the air molecules around it and and sometimes they add up to make it. Uh, oscillate fast, and sometimes they go down. And this is actually this is I, I chose that because the time scale of how that happens is such that on the millisecond time scale you would see it. So this is this is not so underdamped that that there's no effect, and it's not so uh, it's not overdamped already such that it would just you know decay. This somewhere in between, and one always I mean one has to. This is why one has to. In an experiment, integrate over an appreciably longer time than one over gamma, in order to really um, detect the variance of the frequency. And this is actually where I wanted to go to. Um, so, the this is something that is always important in the context is the equipartition theorem, uh, which tells us uh, which tells us that that we have um, the, the thermal energy, actually one half here, it's one half, it's the um, mechanical energy, tension energy. So, so we, we need to use this uh, to determine the temperature. If we take the variance of the signal here, um, then we can determine the temperature of the oscillator. And as I said, we have to do this over a very long time. For example, down here, um, we are four orders of magnitude slower in decay, and that's the most recent. And um, just to give you, just to give you uh, some numbers, if I if I would take uh, a harmonic oscillator at uh, at uh, two pi times ten to the megahertz oscillation frequency, um, then I would get. Oh, sorry, I didn't make this example before. A mass of 50 nanograms, this is 
what I roughly what I showed you before, and um, then then I then I would get uh, a thermal displacement sigma x of uh, 10 to the minus 12 meter. Roughly this. And um, now now I can ask the question: um, How much? Uh, light force do I need on such a resonator? Say we, we have this mechanical resonator here, and there's a mirror on top, like the one you saw on the slide before. And I have a light field reflected off here. What I would like is that the force that I apply with the light field is appreciable compared to the, compared to the, um, to the force that is typically acting by the spring constant, right? So, so if I say I, I take a wavelength of 1064 nanometers and uh, and and a power of um, of one watt of a laser, then um, then my my force on the on this oscillator is. Um, the number of photons that I get per time times uh, h bar k, and, and I would get uh, roughly a force of five nanometer. Now if I look at the, the force that is applied by the, opti uh, by the spring here, then uh, that would be um, m omega square x. Uh, m omega square sigma x would be roughly the average force that is applied on the particle, uh, on the on the resonator. Sorry, and what I get for that would be roughly on the order of two nanometer. You can easily calculate that yourself, of course. But um, what you see is that that I can use with a. I mean, it's not a weak laser, right? It, it, uh, but but with a with a strong laser beam, I can appreciably push this um, this resonator out of its equilibrium position. Okay, so um, when we analyze this kind of uh, this kind of system, then we often don't look into this time domain picture that uh, you see here, but but one looks at the spectrum, and you saw spectra of this, yes? Yes? It's much stabler than this one. I, I agree. I agree. So, so the thing that happens here is that that we get into into a very underdeveloped region, and actually we start to see uh, funny effects um, that that are going on. For example, um, for example, in here the the particle seems to get. We haven't completely resolved the the reason for that, but the particle seems to to do some some funny and uh, non harmonic motion. Not because of the unharmonicity of the trap, but because of uh, some some dynamics in the region, and we believe that this is due to um, due to noise on the on the system. Right. Um, uh, so position noise on the on the whole um, setup uh, that is still damped out here, but also noise due to um, so so the the radial the radial motion and the axial motion start to couple, and they have uh, the axial motion has a quite lower frequency. So we believe that this comes into play when we come uh, in this region. But as I said, it's not it's not completely resolved yet. But because uh, I do agree, um, what you would expect theoretically is if you go from here on, it doesn't it doesn't get worse anymore. I mean, only. The They're all the same temperature. 
are of order room temperature. Which is another thing that is, um, I didn't say that because it's not so relevant at this point, but of course this is uh, selected data in a sense, because um, on that, as you see, here you see this uh, fluctuation on, on a time scale, right? Now this time scale gets much, much, much longer here. So, so in fact, sometimes the resonator would be fairly cold or, or oscillating little, and sometimes it would be oscillating quite a bit more. And, uh, and one would, on this time scale, not even expect, even if it's thermalized, one would not, on this time scale, expect that it's all the same. Because on a very long time scale, this oscillation will be much bigger or smaller. So the, I mean, in the, in the end, this, this is why the, that's a not nice graph. So this is what, we, what you have seen in the, in, the, in the talk before already, and uh, something that you probably also know. Um, for those who don't recall, like I did when I started my PhD, uh, my postdoc in this field, how the details were. Um, uh, this is, this is a, a noise power spectrum. And um, for the analysis of this uh, thermally driven system, and and it essentially boils down to the Fourier transform of the of the uh, motion in time. Now, in the lab, I would not be able to take the Fourier transform from uh, like from minus infinity to infinity. So, so one averages. for a time uh, tau. And then to get the spectrum, um, we take the, this x tilde absolute square, which would then give us some, some kind um, of, of funny thing if I do this once, because it's a fluctuating system. And then if I do this me uh, the same measurement many times and, and make an average over that, then what I get is um, what you see here, uh, a nice Laurentian. Now, now this is what, you, what is called the noise power spectrum, SXX of omega. And now there's the wiener kinchin theorem. Which tells us that can essentially have that the that SXX is um, the, the Fourier transform from minus infinity to infinity over, over the autocorrelation function. And in the end, um, for, a, for a time t equals zero, sorry, I didn't finish my slide. So this is, of course, for a stationary process where, where the whole thing uh, doesn't change on average over time. And, and I can conclude from that that um, the integral over the power spectrum, the omega over 2 pi, uh, would be just So, so that means that I cannot only see in this here um, uh, the, the frequency of the particle, and the, and uh, this width here gives the line is the damping that we saw in the ring down measurement, but also the area under this uh, curve would correspond to the temperature because of the equipartition. And um, just to point that out as well, so, so we have this force noise here, F thermal, and, um, and we know that, that there's a 
Fourier transform of the of the position noise is given by the susceptibility of omega um, times the sorry times the the spectrum of the noise. So as Brownian noise is, is white noise, and later on when we talk about shot noise, that would be the same. The, this noise would not depend on the frequency. And we just see the shape of the susceptibility when we look at the power spectrum as x, x of omega equals absolute square of the susceptibility times the susceptibility just for completeness as I said uh, gives us the Lorentzian one over m times gamma m u i so uh, many of you everyone I guess has seen has seen uh, this these kind of things before I just thought I summarize it um, one uses this um, spectrum essentially all the time here, so it's good to recall. Yes? Um, I, I agree. So, so what I mean with gamma over two is, is uh, one doesn't see it well, is uh, the, the half width here where the system decays down here. And yeah, and, and the whole thing is, is, yes, and the whole thing is a, is a power, it's, it's good to see. Yeah, 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 sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, there's, there's a distinction, um, I should say why there's the confusion. Um, so, so this is the power spectrum, and this is, uh, and as compared to the amplitude spectrum. So one can one can look at uh, one can use this kind of thing to analyze to analyze the mechanical oscillator and this is uh, data from our lab and I say more about how this data is actually taken later on. Um, so so the particle would be trapped, for example, in a in a standing wave in this case, and um, and what one can see is one if one changes uh, the power of the trap, which essentially changes the e uh, theta squared here. Then, then the frequency should, should go with the square root, and we see that um, square root dependence on the power, uh, where this power is an infracavity power. And also, um, when one looks at the kind of curve that you saw before and takes the Fourier transform, then, then we see that uh, the line width actually goes smaller when we go down in pressure. Now, for very low pressures, as a as a side note on the on the mechanical, on the levitated particles, for very low pressures, this dependence goes with uh, one over the with one uh, it goes linear with the pressure, and and this is I guess easy to see because when the particle is moving in, in some environment, then then the velocity. Um, makes more particles, uh, the particles from one side kick with a higher velocity than from the other. And the whole momentum transfer just comes from the numbers of particles times the, the recoil. So, so at the lower pressure, low, uh, less particles kick and the whole thing goes linearly into the thing, into the, into the damping of the particles. And, um, Typical noise power spectra don't look as beautiful as it as it did before. We saw a similar graph also also in the last talk. Still, um, a silicon nitride membrane or a candy lever like like I drew here, tempt one would not only have one mode, right? It would not just do this. It would go like this and and bend up and down. Um, so it has many many modes, and um, and. This green is just a whole forest of, in this case, not a cantilever, but a membrane, very similar to the membrane, um, a graphene membrane you saw before, 
where one, where one can um, see all kinds of drum modes. This is, of course, a problem because uh, you need to separate the, free, uh, the one mechanical mode that you're looking at from all the other modes. And this is where another one of the nice parts about dedicated nanoparticles comes in. Uh, the, the red curve here is the spectrum over a bigger range taken from one nanoparticle. And as you would expect, it has three directions to move. In this measurement, one direction, uh, one direction could not be seen. Uh, that was the axial one here. And the two radial ones can be seen. And uh, they don't have exactly the same frequency, um, but, <clears throat> but they are pretty alone. Um, I, I would do that in the very <laughs> end of the lecture, I guess. But um, um, yes, there's ideas. Now, I, I showed you that, that this mechanical cue is kind of a figure of merit. And, and this here is a comparison of many, many different kinds of mechanical oscillators. The mechanical cue, of course, tells me how far uh, how, how well the system is isolated from its environment. And if I want to, yes? Well, now it's all classified. And, and in fact, um, this, is, this is the thing for, for everyone who is, has been working in the field for a long time, or was, actually, now it changes, um, until like, 2011, so or so, very recently, I will come to that in a moment, um, all we did was classify the entire system. I mean, there was all nice, there's a lot of nice proposals on, on how to use mechanical, optomechanical systems for all kinds of tests of quantum physics, but at that point, um, yeah, up to that point, seven years, six years ago, uh, we worked classified. But then the, the, the figures of merit are, are, we use are, are often the same. So, so the mechanical cue tells us how fast the energy dissipates in the environment. And, and this is why this number is important. And it will, as I show you in a few moments, um, it will go into how fast the system decoheres. So, so this is to, to give you a feeling for the numbers. Um, as you can see here, there's a, there's a dependence between um, the volume uh, that, or mass, if you like, that a, a typical mechanical resonator would have and, and the quality factor. And um, the larger the thing, the higher the quality factor can be. And, and in here is the region where, where many of the optomechanical systems uh, are happening. And um, to add it to this, to this graph from, from a few years ago have now been um, the levitated systems, which I was talking about, which are actually up here already, um, um, beating, beating any of the clamp systems simply because you can't dissipate your environment. But then not all of the clamp systems because um, they are also getting better. And there's two, two recently published examples, um, also 2016, this one here, um, where, where one has especially designed membranes of silicon nitride again, um, and, and they are put under high stress and hanging on these kind of strings, and this isolates the system very well from the environment as well. And in fact, uh, this is just as well isolated as a levitated particle. Yes? Yeah. Um, I would I would say that so so this is this is just kind of an observ observing plot right it's just collecting all kinds of mechanical resonators not optomechanical ones but all kinds um, but then the bigger the mass the higher the inertia the less the particle would be in influenced by by its environment I would say and then and then in turn um, also dissipate. It's easier to isolate such a high mass system. That's 
that's the that's the meaning of or why it looks like that. I don't think I could, I don't think one could divide. Yeah. Omega. Um, aha. Yes. Oh, um, so if if you talk about the levitated system, uh, yes, but 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 in in this kind of systems, the dependence of frequency and mass can be completely different. But then, but then there's, there's some truth in it because the ma massive systems, simply because of their inertia, would often be lower frequency. Now, now let's add the cavity finally because we slowly want to go to do something with the system. Um, we saw here that we need a, a lot of power to appreciably influence the system, so, um, so we could actually get this directly. Typically, people uh, would think of cavities to enhance the powers, but not only for the enhancement of the powers, but also for the effects that I'm, I'm going to show you right now. And I, I stick to a classical uh, description, um, but, but we write down the So when, when, I, when I put a cavity, a fabric perot cavity here, then, then there would be still this mirror, right? And, and the light circulates in here. And um, what, what I get then is that when the mirror moves, that the length of the cavity changes, and therefore the wavelength of the, for the resonance position needs to change, so I get a, a a dependence of the frequency of the cavity. So if I if I change the length, then I would see for a given uh, frequency of the driving laser, I would see this typical behavior, right? Um, I change the length or the frequency, and I get this going. So um, with the displacement here, the length of my cavity changes. And now, if my um, laser is here is tuned such that I'm sitting here on the side of the spectrum, and I use um, <clears throat> and I keep the laser frequency constant, and I have a small modulation of this displacement here. What happens is that I, I change the power in the cavity depending on x, and here's the equation for that. So um, the force on the on the mirror is given by uh, the power over c. And um, if I can linearize that to see roughly the effect. Now, now, if the cavity is uh, decaying fast, so if the motion is much faster than the cavity decay, I can say, well, the thing is moving up and down here. There's a power change along with it. And I can add this to, uh, to my equation of motion that we had before there. And it looks like the spring constant changes. So that is the, what people call the optical and it changes the susceptibility of my mechanical um, If my, my cavity is a very good cavity, then the circulation of my light inside the cavity is, is going on for much longer. And if the decay time of the cavity is on the order of the, of the frequency of the resonator, then there's a lag. The displacement would be uh, coming first, and then a little bit later the power change. So therefore, um, my, my, uh, I get, a, I get a, a force on the particle uh, that is um, kind of having a, a velocity dependent contribution, if you like, so derivation of the, of the mechanical resonator. And I can apply work on, on the system. And if I, if I apply, um, if I do it on, on the cooling side, so here, always when the resonator 
would start to swing back, the power would still be very high, and when it um, goes, when it passes the center, would be um, actually low. So, so, so I get this velocity. Sorry, that was a bad expression. Let's start from the beginning. So, whenever the resonator has a fast velocity in one direction, the power would still be a bit higher than expected, and therefore it sees more force counteracting the, the, uh, the motion. And this is an easy way to explain. Why, why the motion is damped. Now, now if I can, I can, on the other side of the spectrum, I can do the opposite, and uh, whenever it's moving back, I increase the power and I push it. So work is applied and, and the whole system uh, has a different damping. These effects have been observed um, also only after, after the millennium. So um, apart from this uh, kind of pioneering experiment, um, I won't go into so so people started uh, in 2003 or so to, to build all kinds of resonators here this one still looks very ugly it's, it's one of the first examples in the Aspenmeyer labs um, where where this where one could slow that one show that one could um, optically tune this this mechanical uh, the susceptibility where one could show that one can actually cool the resonator with it and uh, that was kind of the beginning of the research. This is how such an optical spring, uh, this is how such an optical spring would look like. And, uh, and if I change the detuning of my laser, then the effective frequency of my mechanics changes. And if I change the detuning of the laser, also the, the damping. This is directly measured again on the nanopile. And if, if you wonder about the details of this graph, they are not important so much in the context now, but one can, um, one can get um, how strongly the interaction is out of, out of this kind of plots. And here, when one fits these lines of the data, and the dashed lines here are actually not, not fitted, but they are derived. Um, this was for me the reminder to tell you how the whole thing would be described quantum mechanically. What? Right? Oh, yes. See, I, I, um, I do realize that I, that I did something that was maybe not so clever as I chose sample data here that uh, I didn't explain the experiment yet. I will only explain it later, but I can I can uh, tell you what we mean. Um, the, the, well, well, one can say it in an easy way. Essentially, the mu boils down to how much uh, power I use in the cavity. If uh, the more power I use in the cavity, uh, the effect is stronger. So it's a bit more involved because it's about a levitating particle. So, so there we we use one light field. Uh, to hold it, and another one to do this effect, and the mu would actually be the ratio. <clears throat> so, I, I will in a moment uh, this, uh, go to the to the Hamiltonian description. But there's one thing that I that I still wanted to to note. Um, because we need it several times, um, and that is on the description of such an optical cavity. So there's no space anymore. Um, I go here. So just to have all the all the relevant parameters together for optical cavities. So. Um, we, we have, of course, uh, some, some frequency of, of our light field, which is typically on the order of 10 to the minus 10. Um, which is typically on the order of 10 to the 15 hertz. That is to point out that the corresponding mechanical frequencies we're going to talk about are on the order of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 9 hertz. So, so there's a big gap between the, between the oscillators. And uh, how we can, uh, why we can bridge this gap is something we'll see in a moment. 
Um, then, then we have something, that, so that essentially corresponds to the mechanical frequency in a mechanical resonator. Then, then we have the cavity decay time, which is just also uh, essentially the same parameter as we had before for the gamma uh, mechanical um, damping. And um, here we would typically, that, that depends very much on the system. We cannot, not, I cannot give a, a general number here. And then instead of the mechanical Q, uh, a cavity would typically be described by the finesse. And the finesse, is um, at least for long cavities, and the finesse is given by pi c over two um, l kappa. And this is the, what that means is easy to see. If I if I take this uh, this optical cavity, then um, with my drive laser, then I would not only have have one resonance frequency, but of course, um, whenever whenever n lambda fits inside the cavity, then, then I get a new resonance. And, and this finesse is just the ratio of the of this free spectral range. That is the distance between these peaks and the line width of the peak. Because the free spectral range is one over the round trip time in the cavity, and that's C over 2L. It's C over 2L over kappa. And, and the finesse is actually uh, the, number, the number of round trips in, in such a cavity, and therefore the enhancement I get is, is actually the finesse over pi. Okay. So if I, if I talk about power enhancement in the cavity, then, then um, this, is, this is, so to say, the number, the finesse. Sorry, one more. What time will the reaction So, so actually, actually, uh, thanks for the question. Actually, from the very beginning uh, of these times of this like early experiment I showed, the, the goal was to, as a first milestone, so to say, uh, prepare a, a, a pure quantum state of motion, um, and that that would be then the ground state cooling. Um, and the, yeah, the question was how, how to achieve that, <laughs> and it has been achieved only pretty recently. So, so at, at this point, I just wanted to, to get all the all the numbers together. Of what we have. Okay, so that's that's a good point. We we are at the at the um, point where we want to use a quantum description. Now, okay, so, so at this point, at this point, we have a system that looks like this one here. And it essentially can be described by two harmonic oscillators, the mechanical oscillator and the optical oscillator. And, and we can write uh, Hamiltonian for the cavity system. That would be just H bar omega cavity A dagger A. And uh, one for the mechanical system. And then um, what we also still need is, is some driving of this cavity. And, and that would be described by some A to the I omega uh, pump T plus A mega T to the minus I and um, and the op
optomechanical interaction, as I said, comes from the fact that this, uh, that omega c is the omega z of x. So if I from cannot see that from there, right? I just realized we can see it again. Is it okay? Yeah. Um, so, so I have h bar and I linearize omega c uh, around some omega c uh, zero, I call it prime, I don't think we need the prime anymore, uh, omega c plus some d omega over dx times x. For small displacements x. And therefore we get here again the a, a, a plus another term h bar omega cavity um, a dagger a and now um, sorry I just want to do that uh, that, the, that the coefficients work out correctly and now we can quantize uh, this x and to quantize this x we would say this is a x zero point fluctuation times an operator x, which would be one over square root of two um, d plus d dagger x. Uh, frequency dependence of omega c come from? So, so this is what? Uh, what does, where does the frequency dependence of omega c come from? Um, this is exactly describing what I meant when I said that the motion of the mirror changes the length of the cavity. Then the resonance condition changes, which leads to a position-dependent frequency, which we saw in the like classical physics slide before. And um, and uh, and this is essentially what I did here. But the, the, it's a, it's a very valid question, also in the sense that um, this is of course. A, a, requirement on my system that I actually can do that linear, linear approximation, right? Um, as we will see in a, in a bit, um, one can also have a system where, where this linear term doesn't even exist. Yes? And the d omega dx is the omega c in the second term? Ah, I'm sorry, I just forgot it. Um, a corresponds to, thanks, I can draw it here on my cavity drawing. Um, a corresponds to the light field. This is the number of photons in the cavity. And, um, and, and B corresponds to the, is, is the position of the resonator. And, and uh, this, this is now what would be my, my interaction term. So in the end, I get an interaction term that looks like h bar g naught a dagger a um, times b plus b dagger, where g naught is... Um, where g naught is d omega over dx times, and I, I write, I didn't write the zero point fluctuation out here, but it's h bar over m omega, and then there's the two from the one over square of two, still, that's my, that's my interaction, um, g naught. And um, the important part, and why, why I actually, showed this explicitly is um, I, we always had this uh, comparison now with a, with a mechanical resonator changing the cavity length. But um, we, we do have all kinds of system where a motion of the 
of the system changes the resonance frequency. One example is, is this one here, where, where one has a, well, I, I show it to you on another slide. Right. So this is just a model for all kinds of, of mechanical systems. So, so the systems that have been built would be, um, for example, our cavity, right? That's what we've been talking about. But you could also uh, put atoms inside the cavity, or you can put the nanoparticle inside the cavity, or in this case, what is done nowadays often a membrane. Um, here, this is uh, a toroid where, where one has bending mode, which changes the length of, of the diameter, and uh, which changes the diameter. And if light is propagating around this toroid, then you would then you would get uh, also an optical cavity. Actually, they can do that with extremely high quality, and uh, and that length would change. Or and and this is one of uh, one of the most fascinating systems right now. I would say um, here uh, this is a waveguide for photons and phonons, and it's particularly des designed to confine in a certain uh, volume together um, a mechanical phonon and an optical photon uh, such that they can interact when this thing stretches. And what is also a standard system is, is this type of membrane. And in this case, it's not an optical system, but a microwave system where one would have two plates and uh, the capacity between the two uh, changes with the distance and therefore one gets an interaction of the electric field with this, with this membrane. So it's kind of the a rough overview of the zoo of optomechanical systems. There's many others around the world. And um, as, as we've been talking, um, mass is the relevant parameter. And in fact, they do exist on all kinds of mass scales. I mean, people all over the globe essentially right now work with, with different kinds of system depending on the goal that is, that is pursued. And, um, and we can see optomechanics with these uh, big LIGO mirrors in principle uh, down to single atom mirrors. Um, so I, sorry for jumping here because I jumped over this dot. Um, this is again to give you a feeling for the numbers. Uh, just the order was a bit reversed. So uh, this, these dots are for, for the six types of system that I've been talking about. And it's not important now which point is what. It's just important to see uh, what are typical uh, frequent, uh, typical interaction rates uh, with a single photon. And, um, and this is here compared to, to the cavity decay rate. Because if my cavity decays before, before my interaction with the photon can go on, then nothing is wrong. Right? So, so this is a relevant value to compare to. And uh, as you can see here, um, most of the systems lie between 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the 2 or so uh, single photon coupling rate. So when we think of the high frequencies of the resonators and uh, cavity decay rates, which are on the order of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 9-ish or so, then this is extremely small. We cannot, at this stage, we cannot work with, uh, with uh, this interaction happening not the interaction rate or if you it's equivalent to the Rabi frequency in, uh, in the atom systems it's just far too small and this is why in optomechanics one uh, typically would use a trick and linearize the whole system uh, which gives one a different interaction and an enhancement by um, and an enhancement by by the field strength inside the cavity Now, I do realize that uh, A, I went a bit slower than I thought. <laughs> I wanted to have you much deeper in the science already um, for repeating that. And I, um, and I have, do also realize that I only have 10 minutes left. So um, I will still show you um, at this point the I think the, the, the steps very quickly on how this is linearized. Um, just you see what people would do mathematically. And 
and then I will uh, discuss the case of the cavity if I still have the time, or start over with that uh, next week after the break. So, for the linearization of the system, I stay over here because that's where the Hamiltonian is written. Can, can you read that? For me, it all looks like you could. Um, okay, very quickly. So, so we, we are left with this Hamiltonian, which is altogether now um, the, the cavity Hamiltonian plus the the one for the mechanical resonator, which I wrote there, plus the drive, uh, plus the H interaction, right? And, and this has been modified. Um, now, in this total Hamiltonian, um, we can now go to a rotating frame with the, uh, with the pump beam. So that would be a unitary transformation that is e to the minus omega uh, pump. Did I write it? Yes. e to the minus omega pump. A dagger A. And, uh, and that would, would give us a, a new Hamiltonian I call Hamiltonian 2, uh, which is then just, I write that also as a reminder without doing the calculation really. Um, That would be uh, the transformation on my Hamiltonian. And uh, what I get out of this is H bar delta A dagger A plus H bar omega M B dagger B plus H bar G naught The driving um, is now a dagger plus b. So we lost the rotating terms here, and more importantly, uh, what we got in, in in the mechanical resonator for the cavity is uh, only the detuning. Delta is omega um, cavity minus omega pump, and that means now that we can actually choose the frequency of this part and why we can make the, the, the frequent, this oscillator frequency on the same order of, as the mechanical resonator. Right? In this rotating frame, we, we can have just a detuning of omega m and thereby um, two, two resonators of, that are roughly impedance matched. But, but the, interaction is, uh, the interaction is still small. And, uh, and that was just the first step. So the next, the next thing would be that we uh, look at the interaction. If uh, for, for a strong field. So a strong field in the cavity. And for a strong field in the cavity, I can um, say that I describe my that I described my creation and annihilation operators as some, some classical part, alpha, plus uh, the fluctuation. Right? So that would be the, um, only the case, of course, if alpha is, is very large. And accordingly, the, the A dagger goes to alpha star plus um, A dagger. And then, for my interaction Hamiltonian, if I do that substitution, I see that I get um, I see that I get H bar G naught times absolute alpha square plus alpha A plus alpha star A dagger 
plus a dagger a times b plus b dagger a. And now, now this part here would correspond just to, uh, uh, this is uh, just the classical um, intensity uh, times the position operator. That's just the displacement of my mechanical oscillator. So I can neglect that. Um, or actually, I, I can put it in the other Hamiltonian, but it doesn't change the dynamics at all. And then this part here is very small compared to, um, compared to uh, this part, where we have alphas inside. So I neglect it as well for the interaction Hamiltonian. And what I get out of this is then h bar g naught alpha a plus alpha star a dagger, b plus b dagger. And, um, and now I can, now this you really don't see anymore. <laughs> All right. And what I can do finally, and this is the last step on this, uh, is that I say that the phase of my alpha really depends on the phase of my drive. So without loss of generality, I can uh, just uh, put the phase, uh, set the phase such that I can rewrite the Hamiltonian as h bar g naught times alpha times a plus a dagger times b plus b dagger. And, and this here um, which we would call g, is a, is a new interaction, and this value of alpha can be large, right? If I, if I talk of a watt in the cavity, like I said before, um, then that corresponds to 10 to the 19 phot photons or so, so alpha would be roughly 10 to the 9 or 10, and then, and then uh, this g naught is enhanced by this factor of 10 to the 9 or 10. Um, this term, ah, so so uh, this term is now is now the just the absolute square of the classical part of the field. So what what this part would just give a h bar g naught a times b plus b dagger, right? So what this describes is is a displacement of my mechanical mirror by some value that is given by the intensity. So, but, it, but it's, it's not a fluctuating quantity, it's just a DC displacement of my mirror. And this is why it doesn't change the dynamics. Yes, so, so this is my, another question? Yeah, thanks for the question. It's, um, so, so we were discussing that before I came here. <laughs> um, the the thing is that I don't what I what I I don't really um, change my whole Hamiltonian just by. Um, so the proper way to calculate this would be to to act with the displacement operator. I didn't even do the calculation for that, but um, so what I what I do here is I I essentially just rewrite it for the interaction Hamiltonian to see which terms I can neglect. So I, I, we could, I mean, one, one could think about what it means if, if we do that for the actual oscillator, but it, we would then uh, essentially write the whole thing and, and think if we can neglect something. But it's not, it's not a transformation of the whole Hamiltonian, it's just rewriting and uh, getting the terms out. So are there any other questions? So then, then I may make a last comment. So as I said, I was um, maybe a bit detailed in here. I, I hope that, that you at least like to know, 
know these basics, if you didn't know them already. I will accelerate a little bit more, uh, so you will see more of the implemented science for the next, uh, for the next part of the lecture.